People have been asking me the same question. Henry, what's going to happen with the election? <laughs> I tell them, I don't get anything. I don't get anything. I'm not getting anything. And when you don't get anything from God, it means there's no change. They say, well, have you got any new visions, any new prophecies? No. Why are there no visions, no new prophecies? Because there's no change. The message only changes when we change. The visions only change when we change. The admonishments only change when we are changed. And if you think back about John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, what was his word? Repent! Repent! His voice echoed across the hills there of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven draweth nigh. Repent and be baptized. <laughs> oh, Lord, what did Jesus say when he come out of the wilderness? Repent! He didn't change it, did he? He didn't change it. Where had he just come from? Forty days and nights. Fasting in the wilderness. Being tempted of the devil. Being offered the kingdoms of this earth. If you bow down and worship me, I'll give you the kingdoms of this earth. You say, well, the devil didn't, that wasn't his to give. You've got to remember something. Jesus hadn't said on the cross yet, it's finished. Had he? He hadn't said it's finished yet. His ministry just began. Isn't it interesting that when he fulfilled that righteousness that he told John, let it be this way now to fulfill all righteousness. Why? Because John said, Lord, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to baptize you. You should be baptizing me. <laughs> and Jesus said, let it be this way now to fulfill all righteousness, didn't he? What if Jesus would have given in and said, okay, I'll, I'll baptize you, you know. <laughs> you don't reverse the word of God, do you? You don't reverse the plan of God. You don't reverse what God is speaking. There is no change There's no change needed where there's obedience. Do you know that? There is no change needed where there's obedience. You say, well, our nation's not obedient right now. I know. There's some obedience. There's a measure of obedience taking place now. But I assure you, there's not enough obedience, is there? There's not enough. I... Here last year, I talked about that earthquake. I talked about that tsunami. Well, since I talked about it, I've walked in it now. 250 miles of coastland totally obliterated. All that's left are foundations, people. How many structures would survive with a 100-foot wave coming 500 miles an hour at the coast. How many of these beautiful mansions and houses would survive along the East Coast if 250 miles of that coastland were hit with a tsunami coming 500 miles an hour? You say, oh, it didn't go 500 miles an hour. We watched it on television and it just seemed to just all of a sudden the floodwaters just lifted up and they just flowed in and houses were floating and everything. Oh, you didn't see. You didn't see what I saw. Japan put a gag order on what was allowed to be presented to the world. Japan has been a very proud people. Did you see thousands of people, little schools just swept away in these, these swooshings of water? Students kneeling down to the stone gods, crying out to the stone gods. No, they edited that, people. 
I've been where they knelt down. I've seen their stone gods twice the height of this building and their head and their body and their feet all over the place busted up. Where are the souls that were kneeling down, crying out to them? Because they were told, children, go kneel down to these gods because these are the gods that protect our men that go out to sea. They will protect you. I was with Franklin Graham's people in Sendai. And I met a grade school principal, or, or middle school principal. And he said, when that earthquake hit, as soon as the shaking stopped enough that we could get up off the floor, because we were all on the floor, you couldn't stand in that. 9.0, everything. Your equilibrium, you don't know what's up, you don't know what's down. You don't, you don't do what the movies want to portray, you know. You have your mind, you can run, you can yell, you can do all this. When, oh, no, no, no. No, when the earth is rolling and shaking under you, your feet go out from under you, and you, you can't even crawl. I talked to many people. They tried to crawl to safety, and they just tumbled and tossed around like a marble in a can. Those that cried out to God, the Lord saved. There are houses standing, one or two houses in a village standing, not a bit of destruction, yet everything in front of them, to the right of them, the left of them, and behind them is utterly destroyed. Now you figure that one out, people. <laughs> I'll tell you why. They didn't try to run. They didn't seek to save themselves. They hit the deck on their knees and they cried out to God and God made the waves go around them and the shaking saved their house. <laughs> now the Buddhists are having trouble with this because they can't figure it out. The Buddhist priests have gone to these people and said, we, we don't understand what happened here. What is your explanation? And just one explanation is given. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. When the shaking began, we hit our knees on the floor and we cried out to Jesus. And we said, Lord Jesus, we love you. Save us. Save us, Lord. We love you. And he did. Do you remember the earthquake that hit Indonesia and the tsunami? 310,000 souls swept into eternity. I've worked down by these islands since then, and guess what? The persecuted church in that city <laughs> was having a water baptism secretly up in the mountains because the Islamic people, the terrorists that ruled that area, would kill them if they went down to the beach to have a water baptism on Christmas Day. So they went up into the mountains to have a baptism in the river. And the Spirit of God fell down so heavily. They were slain in the Spirit. They got up worshiping. They were slain again. And they all night long, they said the night of, of, of December the 25th passed so quickly that night. Next thing they knew, the morning came. And they said, well, we've got to get back down to our city. They headed down, but you see... By the time they got there, their city was gone. 310,000 souls swept into the, into the sea. I met a missionary of Japan, of Okinawa, and he and another man agreed, let's, let's go to northern Indonesia for the Christmas holiday and let's enjoy ourselves and rest. So their wife and each of them had a daughter who was going to go with them. And one of the daughters had some kind of an assignment in school come up that she had to attend or she would have been docked in her, her marks. And, and senior girls, you know, senior high school, if you have any problem with your, your grades being at a certain level, you don't get into university. And so she had to stay. And so mama said, well, I'm not leaving you here alone. And so then the other mother, the other girl, said, well, if my friend isn't going, I don't want to go. What will I do? 
So both mamas decided, well, we'll stay home, you men go, and do your scuba diving and enjoy the beautiful coral sea. Go ahead. We'll stay home. They were out scuba diving on that day, that morning of that earthquake. They had just crawled into their boat, pulling off their scuba gear. They hadn't pulled up anchor yet. The waters were crystal clear. But as they're pulling off their scuba gear, all of a sudden the boat begins to jump, and they look, and the waters all around them are leaping. And they thought, what is this? And they said, those crystal clear waters instantly turned to gray and blood as the fish and every living thing was shredded by the coral. And they said, we're looking around, and all of a sudden we hear screaming toward the beach. And we look, and the ocean's coming out. We pull up our anchor because we're afraid if it hooks in with the ocean rising, it's going to pull our boat under. Wasn't that big of a boat? They pull up anchor, and they're being taken out to sea. And they get the motor going, and they start heading toward the shore, and they realize, whoops, wait a minute. There's a wall of water between us and the shore. And they said, we don't want to get caught in that. And they turn, hoping to get around before that wall of water comes in. And all of a sudden, that wave heads and as they're turning back around, afraid to go too far out to the sea, afraid they'll land up over in Sri Lanka on the beach, <laughs> they look and they watch this massive wall of water as it goes. They go over it, heading toward Sri Lanka, and they see another wall of water heading toward the city where they have left their belongings, their passports, and everything. And they watch the entire city crushed by that massive wave and busted up and flowing back into the sea with thousands of people screaming, crying. And they go and they rescue as many as they can and they go and let them out where they can wade in and say, run, get going, go. And they go out until they run out of gas rescuing people. I remember watching that I turned it over to CNN. I like to watch Fox, CNN, MSNBC. I, I like to see what the world is saying. Believe me, they don't speak the same thing. Fox doesn't speak the same language as CNN. MSNBC really speaks a liberal language. I mean, they are bad news. If you want bad news, go on MSNBC. But uh, I hope you've got discernment in what I'm talking about. I hope you've got this. I hope you don't take it as truth, what these medias are telling us. If you do, you are the most gullible person on the face of the earth, and you need to repent. I'm serious. You are being indoctrinated with the, with the world government. You are being indoctrinated with the beast system. And you're not using any discernment. I don't, I don't sit and watch these things all the time. Only when certain events occur, I want to know how they're reporting it. When the Twin Towers came down, I watched CNN show the streets of Gaza. Gaza, in Israel, the Palestinians, the Hamas, you know, in their black and white, checkered-like Raps and all, you don't have any problem knowing who the Hamas are. They have a specific rap, don't they? You know what they were doing on the streets of Gaza? <laughs> Firing their guns in the air. The women were going, -lo 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 -lo! death to the Americans, death to the Americans. I saw it on CNN. I was astounded that that was on CNN. But they only showed it once. I only regret that I didn't record it. They never showed it again. In my travels, I met a, an insurance executive from Atlanta, one of the biggest insurance companies, he come up to me in the meeting, and I was talking about this. And he said, you know, he says, uh, I play golf every week with one of the big executives of CNN. I says, thank you for telling me that. Will you do me a favor? I said, I have a question. He says, what is it? I said, why did they only show this once? They never showed it again. 
Will you ask that executive why they never showed it a second time on CNN, showed Gaza and them firing the gun, screaming, death to the Americans. He said, did CNN show that? I said, yes, they did. I'll guarantee you they did. Boy, he says, give me your phone number. I'll be playing with him this week. He called me back at the end of that next week. He said, I'd just come off the course with my friend. He says, Henry, I asked him the question. He kind of looked at me, searching me over, and said, why are you asking this? And he said, because a minister saw it, and he asked why. And I've got to give an answer to the minister. He said, well... If I give you this and you give it to the minister, he's going to blab it all over the world. But it probably needs to be told. After we aired that once, our phone rang off the hook in the offices. And the voices said repeatedly, you show that again, we will bomb your headquarters. They will disappear from the face of Atlanta. You see, our media is running scared of terrorism, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Well, the word of the Lord this morning is right in the context of Second Thessalonians, isn't it? I wanted to title this this morning, Walking with Jesus. Hey, look, that title still fits. If you don't walk with Jesus every day, you better start learning what it's all about. You better learn what it's all about. Second Thessalonians. I love how he begins this. Paul and Savanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. How much does grace and peace mean to you? What does grace and peace mean to you? In your fiery trials and tests as you walk with the Lord, have you been brought to the place that you have been humbled down to your face to the floor, crying out and saying, Lord, just give me a little more grace and I can believe that you will sustain me through this. That's what pastor was saying. You see, if the righteous shall scarcely be saved, if we don't begin to know our God in the area where the Amplified says, trusting, relying, and clinging to the Lord. I love that, that little portion. I'm, I'm normally a King James man, but that amplified when I read it that time, I thought, oh, I like this. Trusting, relying, and clinging to the Lord. That sounds like hanging on to a lifeline, doesn't it? You're trusting that that rope isn't going to break. You're trusting, you're relying on the person pulling you in, <laughs> and you're clinging to that lifeline. <laughs> we used to sing it years ago, remember? Throw out the lifeline. Throw out the lifeline. Someone is drifting away. Folks, I think that song could be edited today. I think it could be written, Throw out the lifeline. Great multitudes are drifting away. Great multitudes. He says here in verse 3, we are bound. Are you bound? <laughs> Here's the way you better be bound. We are bound to thank God always for you. Are you thanking God for your brothers and your sisters? Are you doing what Paul said in Timothy, chapter 2? 1 Timothy. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, I attended a place where the National Day of Prayer was the other day. People were gathered of many different churches in a big auditorium. National Day of Prayer. I never heard one mention in the National Day of Prayer of our president 
Michelle, his wife, our federal chiefs of staff. I heard the armed forces prayed for. You see, in that auditorium, they violated the word of God representing the National Day of Prayer. First of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, presidents, prime ministers. We got it all backwards. We wonder why our nation's going so bad. We wonder why our leaders don't know what to do. We wonder why they're in confusion. We wonder why our Supreme Court is violating the laws of our Constitution, why our Constitution seems to be dissolving right before our eyes. We wonder why we're not praying for them. We all know 2 Chronicles 7.14. We know it very well. We know it as well as John 3.16. But we're too often bound in the area of John 3.17. How many know John 3.17? For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The nations that I have been walking and praying, I pray for the leaders of those nations. I pray for Obama. I pray for Michelle. I pray for their child. I pray for their family. Yes, I even pray for Grandma Obama over in Kenya, who is a black witch of voodoo. I don't know if you know that. But last year on the National Day of Prayer, I spent, spent four days fasting and praying with 34 people from Kenya. They know the Obamas of Kenya. When I first met them, when in the first month that our president was running for office the first time, they told me that his grandma was sacrificing black and white pit, uh, chickens upon the Mount Kilimanjaro, casting spells on the women of America. And that dear pastor said to me, he said, you don't have to believe me, Brother Henry. But he said, just watch the news. Women are going to start passing out while he is giving a speech. It's the spell that Grandma is casting on them. It wasn't two months, and all of a sudden, all the news media were talking about this. We don't understand what's going on. While he's making a speech, women are just, oh. You see, we don't have discernment today. We don't realize People say to me all the time, Henry, lay hands on me and pray that God will give me discernment. I look at them and I say, you got five of them. How many more do you need? They look at me with the strangest look and they say, five? I can't name a one. I say, well, may I ask you some questions? Sure. Do you see me? Yeah. What's that got to do with discernment? Do you hear me? Yeah. What's that got to do with discernment? If I pinch you, will you feel it? Well, of course. What's that got to do with discernment? If I give you a, a mint, will you taste it? Well, of course. What's that got to do with discernment? Huh? I don't think you understand what I ask you for. I ask you to pray for me for discernment. I say, you don't understand. You got discernment in the garden when Adam and Eve fell. You got five senses now that all of a sudden became aware of sin and of good. You became wise concerning good and evil. Isn't that what the serpent said to Eve? You will be wise. You'll be as gods, knowing both. How many really enjoy both good and evil? The Lord taught me at 18 years of age. I had to go back to the garden. I had to go back and find out from Adam and Eve what took place. I found out. She looked upon that tree. and That old beast said to her, Doesn't that fruit look beautiful? Oh, it does. Prettier than all the other fruit in the garden. Yeah. Touch it. It doesn't bite. 
Touch it. How do you feel? No different. Pick it. Smell it. Wow, it smells sweet. Taste it. Think I should? You're not dead. Go ahead. You'll be as a God, knowing both good and evil. Woohoo! I'm alive. I'm alive. I didn't die. Adam! Adam! Come here! Come here! Hey, take a bite, Adam. What is it? It's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I'm alive. I feel great. Come on, Adam. Take a bite. And you see, the moment he took the bite, then the eyes of them both were opened. You husbands, you better believe you have a covering for your wife. I've been saying for three years now, when my wife has almost died three different times, I've been saying to her, no, no, hon, you're not going. Doctors said her heart's only operating 15%. We don't know what's keeping her alive. I said, I know what's keeping her alive, doctor. I'm her covering. I'm, I'm her husband. I'm overruling death in the name of Jesus. You ought, to, you ought to say that to a doctor and see what kind of look you get. You are what? <laughs> I am breaking the covenant with death because I need my wife. Huh. They walk out shaking their head. Never heard that one before. What if Adam would have done that in the garden? Ladies, you wouldn't have the pains you have all the time. Childbearing would be such a wonderful experience. Every month that you're not bearing a child would be a wonderful experience. There'd be no curse on you. Bless your heart. Yeah, I know they didn't physically die in the sense of that moment. But look at what happened. The eyes of them both were opened. And what's the first thing they saw when their eyes were opened? They lost their covering. They were naked. What is it that they're driving for in America today? 500 people in Portland, Oregon, riding bicycles, walking, demonstrating with nothing on, saying, we're free, we're liberated. Ha <laughs> ha, look at that. You can't arrest 500 people. We have the right through the endowment of arts to express ourselves. I listen to the news in the big museum of art in New York City. Now there's men and women standing there with nothing on. So you can look at a human body. It's art. Are we going right back to the garden? Have we made a full 360? Have we really gained anything? Oh, people, we need a covering. We need a covering. You see, Pastor talked about the bridegroom. Why are we called the bride in Revelation 19? Why does he say in Revelation 3, the most prosperous church of the seven churches, that says, I sit as a queen. I'm wealthy. I have need of nothing. To see some of these ministers on TV today, they are depicting exactly the Laodicean spirit. They're wealthy. Their setting is in gold. The thousands of people that flock to them and they speak such a lovely, smiling, comfortable message. Soothing the people to sleep. When the Spirit of God is saying, Here! Awake! Here! 
hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. They say, oh, no, no. No, no, don't, don't raise your voice. I was in the biggest Methodist church invited to speak in Iowa. <laughs> my mama was a Methodist. My papa was a, my, my grandpa on her side was a Methodist. All the way back to, back to lovely Daniel Webster in my mama's side and Ulysses Grant, President Grant. On my mama's side, all Methodists in my genealogy. On my, my daddy's side, well, a little different. <laughs> Thank God for mama. Daddy got saved and filled with the Spirit when he went, he began to take a liking to mama. And so he was drawn to church down in the basement of a storefront church in the winter in Iowa. And he got to see the power of the Holy Ghost for the first time in his life. He watched that pipe coming out of that, that boiler. And this man was full of the Holy Ghost. He grabbed the pipe, put his cheek against it, and he went to try to pull him off, figuring he's going to pull his flesh off from his arms and his cheek. He couldn't pull him off. He thought he's going to drop dead any second. Next thing he knows, the man let goes and he's dancing all over his face isn't even red. His arms are not burnt. He grabs the pipe and about loses the flesh off of his hand. And he thought, I'm going to the altar. <laughs> now that's how my daddy got saved. He saw the hand of God, but his hand was burned. He learned. The power of God will exclude you from destruction of your flesh if you are in the Spirit. <laughs> they were in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. <laughs> what day is the Lord's Day? Not only Sunday, people. The Lord's Day better be every day. People say, well, I, I, I believe in the Shabbat. I say, I do too. But it's not sundown Friday night and Saturday morning till sundown Saturday. It's every day. If I cease from my own labors, every day I get to have the axe. I get the axe. You know what I mean? Acts 1.8. The power to be a witness. It means I've been empowered for my eyes to be anointed with salve, as he said to the Laodicean church. And I realize when I sin, I'm wretched, I'm miserable, I'm naked, and I'm blind. And I come to realize that in my life, I need a Savior. I'm in trouble. I can't save myself. You know, I was flying up into the eastern states from Oregon a few years ago, and there the New York Times had an article about the, I think it was the Winston Man or the Marlboro Man, whichever one that's on the big horse in the Rockies, and he's got this cancer stick in his hand. Remember that? the Marlboro man. He's a self-made man. I'm on this big powerful horse. I can handle this all by myself. I don't need any help from you. I ride the range. I got a thousand head of cattle. I don't need any help from anybody. I've got everything I ever needed, including my Marlboro. Guess what it said in that New York Times? That little bitty cancer thing, we call them cancer sticks, finally got him. He died of cancer of the lungs. Did it get him? Yes, it did. I wonder what he looked like when he died. I know what I looked like when I battled cancer for two years. Boy, I went to a walking skeleton real fast. They sicked a doctor on me. I didn't go to the doctor. <laughs> they put me in a Bob Evans restaurant, put me in the corner, pulled three tables together, put pe six people to the left of me where I couldn't get out, put five people across from me, the doctor right across from me. The doctor took one look at me and said, tell me your symptoms. I said, what for? Well, I'm a doctor. 
I want to know what you've been through. I said, well, all right. I'm hemorrhaging through my bowels, my urine. Is that enough for you? The pain when I hemorrhage is excruciating. I'm soaked with sweat. But when I walk and pray, there is no hemorrhaging. When the anointing is on me, there's no blood flow. There is no pain. Three weeks ago, six o'clock in the evening, I hit the floor. My body doubled in a fetal position. The pain was excruciating so bad that I passed out. For six hours, I would pass out. I would come to. I would have maybe 20 seconds to pray and cry out to God, and then the pain would be so severe again, my knees would double again on my chest, and I would pass out. Now, doctor, do you need to know any more? The doctor looked at me, shook her head, and said, In my life, in all the years of my profession, I have never heard of a person who went through cancer metastasizing into the spinal column without any pain medication. I said, what do you mean, cancer metastasizing? I don't know these terms. I don't. It doesn't talk about the word metastasizing in here. <laughs> this is my knowledge book. Now, we had six of our 13 children at home. So I read a lot of medical journals about childbearing because I wanted to know what was going to happen. When mama tossed the baby, I wanted to be ready to catch it, right? And if there was a complication, I wanted to know what it was so I'd know how to pray. Amen? Yeah. It's called symptoms, right? So I knew I had symptoms with the cancer. And yes, we had six of them at home. And yes, we had about every complication you can name, including one born dead, of whom it was prophetically given over us before she was even expecting, the wife, that it would be a son and that he would be a prophet to his God. But uh, my prophet was born dead. His body, horribly stinking with death. We figured been dead for several days in mama's womb. Now what are you going to do with the word of God? What do you do with 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20? <laughs> I call it the 2020 vision verse of the Old Testament. 2020 is good vision, isn't it? Wouldn't need these if I had it in this eye. This one, I don't need it, but uh, that's one of these things for some reason we have to bear sometimes. I don't know. It keeps me humble, I guess, to wear glasses. <laughs> I've seen so many other miracles in my life, but I still have to wear glasses. Isn't that foolish? Yeah, I've been anointed for eyesight and I've gone for days trying to get around. <laughs> but by law, I can't drive a car if I don't have glasses on. And I didn't believe in putting clear ones on because that's deception. And I don't believe letting any kind of deception in. So I finally put my glasses back on so I could drive. <laughs> but we had a word from the Lord. By this time next year, you will bear a son. He will be a prophet to his God. Now I'm holding... A dead prophet in my hand. The cord is around his neck four times. He was strangled in the womb. I gently turn him around, carefully removing that cord from around his neck because I don't want to tear it inside mama. She'll hemorrhage to death in less than three minutes. So you, you use that great care. See, it's good to read medical journals if you're going to have to practice these things. Yes, I practice medicine without a license. But it was my wife, and I had a right to do it because I'm her covering. So they can argue that to the Supreme Court. Now, I'm not going to deliver your baby, lady, so relax, all right? Then I would be practicing medicine without a license, and I have no desire to do that unless it's an emergency and I'm the only one there. They're not going to have to do it, aren't we? But I don't choose it. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> I don't run around Dr. Henry Groover delivering babies. I want to be known as that. But as soon as I pulled that last ring of umbilical cord from around his neck, his little neck was just imprinted tight to that cord. 
I put my hands under that little stiff body and I looked up and I said, Father, now the lady that had helped, a cousin that had helped deliver many babies in the hospital, when she saw his head birth, she knew what was coming. She started crying and ran out of the room. She was a lot of good, wasn't she? You see, she missed Acts chapter 1, verse 8. She didn't get the Acts. You see what I'm saying? She ran away from it. In Ephesians chapter 6, it says, when you put on that armor and you've done everything to stand, what are you to do? Stand! Keep your armor ready and your sword ready. Get ready for battle, but stand. You've done everything you can, and then the Lord will be your defense. Now you're anointed to see victory. You're positioned. You're seeing the enemy. Don't turn your back on him. You don't have any armor back there. <laughs> He'll zap you through. You'll be done for. You're vulnerable. Stand and face the enemy in the face of unbelievable odds. When Islam, back in the 1400s, was coming through out of Africa, across the straits of Gibraltar, they were flowing like, like water coming out of Africa. The Knights of St. John fought and fought. This, I stood right there in Gibraltar and read this as I walked it and prayed it. I've learned a lot about the world and the battles of the world walking and praying them. I worked 48 foreign countries walking them and praying them. 12, 16 hours a day in cities, in rural areas where battles were. Wherever the Spirit says go and walk, remitting the sins of innocent blood, breaking the covenant with death, breaking the covenants on sacrifice uh, uh, altars of witchcraft, standing on their altars that are soaked and literally colored with the blood of the victims, standing in caves where the, the handprints of the victims from little bitty three, four-year-old handprints and their name written in blood. You go into those places? Aren't you afraid a demon will jump on you? No! Hallelujah. A demon is not greater than my God. But I do quote Psalms 24 before I go in. Open up, you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors of heaven. There's my great comfort. And the king of glory will come in. That's when I'm going in. I'm going in with the king of glory. No demon's going to jump on me then. I saw a beautiful church there in York yesterday. My beautiful stone church, but they stick these stupid gargoyles out on front to drive away evil spirits. It was a Methodist church. I said, Lord, plug me into John Wesley. I want to tell on them. Bring him back here. I stood where he preached his first sermon in the Black Mountains, the coal mountain, coal mining country of England. The steps are still there of that pub that he stood outside the door preaching into that pub. They began to throw bottles at him. He turned and ran down the street. They threw bottles at him and ran him away. He left his horse on the hitching post at the watering trough. That was his first sermon. Sounds a little bit like Stephen, doesn't it? Peter preaches his first sermon and thousands are saved. Stephen preaches his and he's killed. You see, you beginners that are just beginning to obey the Lord, you don't know your first sermon, you might wind up in heaven. You only get to preach one. But I want to tell you something. The man holding the coat and cheering those on that are stoning you, what did that man do? When his sins were remitted, Stephen cried with a loud voice, didn't he? Fell on his knees after he saw Jesus I see Jesus. He's standing at the Father's right hand. And he went down on his knees. And what's the next thing Stephen did? He did what Jesus did on the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. What do you mean? You don't know what you're doing when you pick up a stone and bash somebody's skull in? No, you don't. Because they were religiously dead in trespasses and sins. Religiously dead. Well, holding that little dead promise of a prophet, I was not religiously dead. <laughs> I was very much alive. The words of that dear prophetess was ringing in my ears yet, even though it had only spoken 
12 months earlier. You're going to have a son this time next year, and he will be a prophet to his God. So I looked up, holding that little still body, and I said, Father in heaven, it's a boy. I know he knew it already. You ever talk to God like he doesn't know something? <laughs> Jesus talked to the Father like he didn't know something, didn't he? When it came to Lazarus at the tomb, he talked to the Father for the sake of those around, didn't he? And so I said, Father, it's a boy. And you promised us a son, and you promised that he would be a prophet to you. To be a prophet, you've got to put the breath of life in him. And I added these words, my own version. And you've got to do it quick. Because in my mind, I thought, if Mama sees this, she could go into convulsions or something, and I could lose Mama too. You know, it's a, it's a risky time, that point of childbearing, when the placenta is not brought forth and the birthing isn't finished. Sorry if we're talking about bearing children, but in sex education, they're teaching toddlers, so I, I think it's nothing wrong with talking about it now. But it's a dangerous time. Because the life of mama and the baby are held in the balance at that moment. That cord is still attached to mama, the lifeline, and it's still attached to the baby. If it ruptures in the baby's navel area, it hemorrhages to death. No doctor can save their life. If it ruptures in the placenta that is still attached to all the blood flow of mama, you lose mama in three minutes. That's serious, isn't it? So I said, you've got to put the breath of life in him, and you've got to do it quick. My two oldest daughters were right behind me. The one that had helped deliver many babies was crying in the other room. She didn't even hear what we heard. All of a sudden, his little mouth opened up, and we heard the sound, <gasps> breath go in. And his body turned the darkest purple and the prettiest pink. Today he's a missionary in Mozambique. Now, we wouldn't have had a missionary in Mozambique if I wouldn't have obeyed the Lord. <laughs> he and his wife sleep in little pup tents on the ground. Last year he came home for a little rest. And he says, Dad, you got a single-edge razor blade? I says, yeah, yeah, I got one. I keep it for scraping paint off the windows when I'm painting. I keep them for that. I got a package of them. That's the only reason we keep them anymore. We don't have single edge razors anymore. Remember, thank God. We got electric ones. <laughs> Do a fairly good job, don't they? <laughs> they leave an occasional hair that gets longer and longer. You got to find it. <laughs> I gave it to him. He went in the bathroom, left the door open. He didn't have any shoes on. He put his foot up on the counter. And I see him going at his foot. And I said, what are you doing? Oh, he said, it's all right, Dad. It's just a little thing you get over there under the man mango trees. And here he has a lump, like the lump on my wrist, right on his foot, like three of them. And he says, it's just a little worm. He cut it, popped it out. You ever seen a grub worm out of the ground? Look a lot like a grub worm, same size and everything. Popped it out. Took a little hydrogen peroxide, put it on the wound, took a butterfly, bang, and finished with all three of them, and took butterfly band-aids, closed up the wound. I said, son, I've worked 48 countries, and I've never had anything like that. Ooh, I said, ah. He said, oh, Dad, stop it. Just a worm. I said, well, how did a worm that big get in there and you didn't know it? He says, Dad, they come in when they go into your pores. They're so small, they're fine as the dust. You walk under the mango trees and they live in that dust and they get into your pores. This happens all the time. It's no problem. I said, Lord, thank you for not calling me to Africa. <laughs> I've walked among deadly snakes. That's all right. 
I've slept on beds of scorpions. That's all right, but I don't want worms in my body. <laughs> I guess we all have our temperaments, don't we? He was telling me, he says, you know, Dad, he says, you ever taken a bath with one gallon of water? I said, what? A bath with one gallon of water. I said, no, I went to take a bath, just got my head shampooed down in, Sam, in, 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 uh, up in Siberia, and the water went off. And here I have a bunch of soap on what little hair I got left. And I'm concerned that it's going to eat away what I've got left because there's no water. So I took a cup and I dipped it in the bowl in the back of the toilet. Not down in the toilet, but the bowl where the water comes out to go in the bowl. Please understand. <laughs> I've never been reduced to dipping it out of the toilet, but out of the bowl. I've dipped it out of that and washed off the soap, but that's... That's the most. I had at least four or five cups of water to get the soap out of my hair. And he says, well, he says, we've gone as much as nine days that there was no water to have a bath. And he says, believe me, Dad, one gallon of water feels so good to wash the dirt away. <laughs> and he says, oh, son. God has given you a greater anointing than he has me. You're going to go farther than daddy's ever gone. <laughs> I've been working in Japan now for 17 years, and they are a clean people. They're out there scrubbing their sidewalks in the morning with a scrub brush. If there's the slightest bit of bubble gum on that sidewalk, they've scraped it off and they're scrubbing it so you'd never know there was any bubble gum on that. They scrubbed their walls. They're a clean people. And after my son had told me this, I was back in January this year after he'd been home in the holidays and told us about it. And, oh, I watched them scrubbing, and I said, thank you, Lord, for these cleansing, clean people. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Lord, that I don't have to go eight, nine days without a bath. Oh, dear Lord. I can drink the water right out of that shower head there in Japan, and it's clean water. Now, I haven't... I haven't always had that luxury. There are places in the earth that I've walked where you don't even open your eyes when you're taking a shower because of the parasites in the water. I've been in that, but I never got worms that I know of under my skin. <laughs> Poor Job, you think about him and the devil. All that a man has, he'll give for his skin. Can you imagine? You ever had a boil? I had one right above my left knee. I remember it. I'll never forget it. I can never forget the pain that shot all the way to between my ears when it looked like it came to a head and I was going to squeeze it, and I screamed out. I was nine years old, and Mother says, Leave it alone. Each day she would pack it with hot towels to get it to come to a head, and it always looked like it had, but if you squeezed that, See, I'm a coward. I'm not a lone ranger. I'm not a hero. Don't look at me as a hero. I'm a ball baby. A man's greatest fearful person. In my distress, Psalms 120 verse 1 is my motto. Whenever distress is coming, I say, Help, Lord! It's me again! I don't hesitate. Because I can't do it myself. You see, in the Bible, he says, cast all your cares on me. How much is all? When you feel like it? When it's convenient? Oh, oh. What if you don't cast that care on the Lord? It gets heavier. It gets heavier. You got this care. Now you got this care. And then you got another care. And pretty soon you care. Right? You're hobbling to the Lord. Lord, I don't know why you do this to me. Dear God, this is heavier than I can bear. Lord, why did you do this? 
Take it, please take it. I can't throw it. <laughs> he says, well, are you finally convinced you can't carry it? You should have cast the first one to me when it first touched you. Then you would know how much I care for you. And you wouldn't be questioning why I don't care for you. <laughs> You see what I'm saying? I climb mountains. I climb mountains, yeah. 70 years old. I'm competing with 20-year-olds climbing mountains in Japan. Japan, you're either going up or down. You're either crawling into a cave or you're going into a Buddhist temple or a Shinto shaman or somewhere of a shaman altar area way up on the top of a cliff, of a cave back in a cliff. I, I'm a cliff climber. I'm a spelunker. You know what that is? That's a, that's a cave explorer. I explore caves. I'm not looking for jewels. I'm looking for altars. I'm looking for places where these people go down into darkness because they love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. Why is it important to go in there? where they're doing these sacrifices and casting out these spells and fetishes because you've got to take dominion over it. You've got to get your foot on that altar and take it back in the name of Jesus and renounce the wickedness of that many generations back to the very first thought, word, deed, or gesture. So you see a 70-year-old man climbing 1,500 steps to a Buddhist temple, you can get a little tired. People come to me and they say, I want to go to Japan with you. I say, all right. How good a physical condition are you? You look like you're a little overweight. I want to tell you something. You get only about the first quarter of the steps to the Buddhist temples I go to. What do you mean? I say, I'm just telling you the truth. <laughs> you got to think about it. Now, I love the sports in school and played in the sports, I had to keep myself in condition, didn't I? I loved high jumping and basketball. So what did I do? I took a piece of Dad's water pipe, I drilled a hole in each end of it, put one of his form nails in there through the hole, took one of the empty gallons of his, his can of paint, poured it with concrete and stuck that hole, that, that pipe down in that concrete with that nail through it and let it dry, set up, then I turned it over and made me another one. And then I ran all over the desert like this, holding that pipe and doing my barbells. That was my homemade barbells. I ran on my toes to build up my calves so I could outjump the six foot sixers. I could take two steps and jump on high jump my height, six one. It totally dispirited my opponents. They said, if he can take two steps and jump five feet, how high is he going? They didn't know that when the bar got just over my head, I couldn't jump it. I don't know why. <laughs> but most of them, their legs turned to rubber before we got to six foot. <laughs> Take two steps and hop over it like it was nothing. And man, that guy's a kangaroo. The sky's the limit. <laughs> well, I had prepared myself, hadn't I? So I could take that ball off the net. I could block it so they couldn't get it. I loved it. It was exciting. It raised the crowd. Woohoo! Wow, way to go, Henry! I could stand under the basket and shoot clear across the whole gymnasium and hit the backboard. And in one game, the coach said, Henry, shoot! And I shot from under the basket and made a perfect shot. And we won the game. <laughs> From, and even, even my enemies, so to speak, jumped up cheering. They'd never seen a basket made from under the basket here to the basket there <laughs> before the bell rang. Woo! I love to see victory, right? I love victory. I grew up on it. I cut my teeth on it. So why should I change if that's the natural? Why should I change in the spiritual? 1 Corinthians 15, 46. Paul spends 45 verses talking about all the things all the way to the celestial and the terrestrial. Is that natural? 
And then he says in verse 46, however, interruption, however, that which was first is not spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward, that which is spiritual. Woo! We had a tsunami hit Japan in the natural. We had a shaking hit Japan in the natural. We've got the Daiichi power plant crushed. Two of those, those, those reactors and the other third and fourth are about to go. I don't know if you know that. You don't hear that on the news over here. They got a problem over there. I was with 21 people down not very far from the Daiichi power plant last August. And the director of the, the charitable mission that I was working with was carrying around a Geiger counter, a meter, to see what the radiation is. All of a sudden, he come running up to me. He says, Henry, we got to get all the workers together. we got to get out of here. The radiation has gone up to 15. 10 is life-threatening. we got to get out of here. I says, call them together. I don't care. Call them together. So he's calling them. Come on, come on, come quick. And they come running from all over. They're giving out free food and clothing and bottles and, and diapers for babies and anything that they need, little tents and things. And... And, and all kinds of liquids for water and drinks, you know, and charging nothing, just ministering to these people who have lost everything. And they gather them all together. I says, hold it now. Don't say another word. Kind of like what he said this morning with a message in tongues. Just hold on a minute. Hold on. Sometimes we do that. I know if you, whoever was giving the message in tongues, don't stop giving messages in tongues because of that. Don't take it personally. I don't know who I'm talking to, but whoever you are, don't take it personally. Just simply continue to obey the Lord and wait on your ministry. I grew up in Pentecost, and we learned that if there is a lull or a silence, you can give that message in tongues. Just wait for the silence. Don't work in on somebody speaking. If the Holy Spirit wants to speak, he's a perfect gentleman. He'll bring a silence. There'll be a hush, what we call a holy hush. We used to call it that. A holy hush will come over the audience. Give your message in tongues. Blah, 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 hallelujah, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? Just give it out. And there'll be a testimony. And believe it or not, you really don't have to yell it. I talked to a girl that I'd gone to high school with, a Baptist girl, into going to a full gospel businessmen's meeting because Wayne Coleman, Mr. Teenage America of 1959, was going to be the speaker, this V-shaped, blonde-haired, blue-eyed bodybuilder in the front page of the Atlas magazine, you know what I mean, and all this stuff. And I kind of knew this girl really liked the physique of some of these guys, and so I said, hey, Mr. Teenage America will be speaking, and I was trying to get this Baptist girl into a Pentecostal meeting. I got her there. I think I still bear the scars on my arm. Right behind us, before Wayne Coleman even comes out to speak in that full gospel businessmen's young people's banquet, somebody right behind us, yay! She grabs my arm. She says, Henry, get me out of here. I said, let go of my arm. Oh, I'm sorry. We had to get out. She was crying. She was shaking all over. We got out the door. She says, what happened? Did that man go crazy? I said, no. You understand what happened? Yeah. What happened? Did he lose his mind? Did he have a heart attack? Was he having a stroke? I said, no. He was just going to give a message in tongues. What is that? Well, one speaks in another language and another interprets. Huh? I don't like that. She died two years ago of cancer. Dear Patty Wilson. She was still a Baptist when she died. Scared Pentecost right away from her. <laughs> you see, growing up in Pentecost, I learned if there's only 15 people, 
just quietly give the message and quietly give the interpretation only to the measure that those nearby can hear it. You don't have to speak it to people three blocks down. We all have hearing. <laughs> right? I've learned a few things. You know? It, it works that way. It works that way. The Spirit of God is a perfect gentleman. I was in a giant meeting with William Branham. Remember William Branham? The Masonic Temple, Phoenix, Arizona. The big giant room of the Masonic Temple. I don't know about that, but uh, <laughs> I only realized that in later years after I walked the path of the Crusades of the Knights Templars and learned a lot about the Masons. And By then, my brother was a 34th degree Mason, my second oldest brother. His father-in-law was the Grand Master of Chicago. Well, my mother's going to have surgery, and so I... I drive all the way from Seattle, Washington, all across the country to <coughs> Mason City, Iowa, to the hospital where she's going to have surgery. And I get there, and they keep delaying the surgery. I drive in a blizzard. The chill factor was 90 below zero. They're warning one minute out there in that cold, and you have frostbite. And uh, I drove all the way through, got there before the surgery, but I didn't get there in time to go and pray for mom before they took her in. I went to the surgery family waiting room, and here's my 34th degree Freemason brother sitting there with his wife, who's a member of the Eastern Star, pickled in the brine of Freemasonry. I had just finished seven years walking and praying the path of the Crusades. The Knights Templars, I learned all about them. Learn about Godfrey Bouillon, how in Jerusalem, in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the Catholic Church, he was knighted as the first knight of the, of the Knights Templars. Did you know that? It's right there in the Church of the <clears throat> Holy Sepulchre. They think it's where Jesus rose from the dead. I'm sorry, when I go into occultic areas and where there's a terrible lie or occultic practice, I get a splitting headache right over here. I walked into that church of the Holy Sepulchre and I about went down on my knees, not because of the holy presence of God, because of demonic oppression. And I hobbled back out of there and I sit down on that stone wall on the left side as you go out of it for 45 minutes praying in tongues till I could get up and walk again and the headache left. Now, do you think that was the church of the Holy Sepulchre? I don't think the Holy Sepulchre was in there. That hole in the floor there is not where my Lord laid. I don't know who laid there may have been Lucifer, but I'm not sure. <laughs> that may be where he hit, remember? When the little finger of God cast him down and the Lord said, I saw him fall as light. That may be the hole where he landed. But it isn't where my Lord come out of. Now, I'm sorry if you're watching this and that offends you. I minister to many Catholic people, but you need to know the truth because the truth will set you free. But anyhow... I sit there, and they kept delaying my mother's surgery because of this blizzard. There were accidents, and the doctors kept coming in, or nurses saying, I'm sorry, surgery's delayed, delayed, delayed. They wouldn't let me go in to my, pray for my mom. I wanted to pray for her so she wouldn't need surgery. You know what I mean? <laughs> I believe God could heal her, but I couldn't get in there. She was already in the surgery room, and they kept delaying, delaying. So I started talking to my brother who said, well, what have you been doing, Henry? And I said, well, I've just finished, come back from Europe, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, Middle East, and Jerusalem praying the path of the Crusaders, Godfrey Bouillon. He says, really? Tell me about it. What did you learn? So for eight hours, I'm telling him, seven years journey. I thoroughly learned about the Knights Templars in those seven years stood where they slaughtered Muslims, men, women, and children by the thousands in Istanbul. That's why Muslims hate Christians today. Are you aware of that? That's the reason they call us the great Satan. I went into the Blue Mosque in Istanbul. It used to be called Constantinople, remember? Because that's where Constantine founded it after he declared the world religion to be Christianity. 
Blue Mosque is the number three Mecca of Islam. The Lord told me to go in. Guess when? Right in the middle of their evening prayers. At least 10,000 Muslims on little mats on the floor in the Blue Mosque, bowing to the east, crying out. I take my shoes off. Of course, I do that when I go in Buddhist temple. It gives me more intimate contact with the ground I'm taking back. I don't mind taking my shoes off. You see what I mean? I don't do it in, in reverence to Muhammad or Allah. I do it or Buddha. I do it. You require it? I'll gladly take my shoes off because now I have got better contact with the land I'm taking back. So that's the way I look at that. I go in the middle of all these people and I begin worshiping the Lord right in the middle of them. A man walks up to me with a white robe on and a gold wrap around him. I learned later he was the number, number one holy man of the third holy place, Mecca of Islam. He said, he approached you? I says, yeah. When he come up to me, he said, what are you doing? You're not facing the east. I said, oh, I'm just worshiping God. Aren't they worshiping God? Yes, but we worship God to the east. I said, oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought I could worship him in any direction. He said, what are you doing here? You're not a Muslim. I said, I know, I'm a Christian. Now that is stupid. <laughs> in the middle of 10,000 Muslims? To say I'm a Christian? I should have had my head gone years ago. See, I, I couldn't have had my head on right saying that, but the Holy Spirit let me say it. And he looked at me with shock and he said, Do you know where you're standing? You're standing in the number three Mecca of Islam. I said, I know. And then the words come out of my mouth when he said, What are you doing here? I said, I've been walking the path of the Crusades. I've stood where Godfrey Bouillon was knighted as the first knight of the Knights Templars. He was the knight that led armies slaughtering your people, men, women, and children in this city. And the tears began flowing down my face, and I said, I'm here to ask you and all of these for forgiveness for slaughtering your people at the banner of the cross, for the cross is the most sacred symbol of Christianity. How could they do that? And he began to weep, and he said, I've never met anyone like you. And he didn't know what to say. And I said, may I stand here in this number three holy place of Islam, and may I ask for forgiveness for the people that slaughtered your people at the banner of the cross. And he said to me, you are a good man. I have never heard or would ever have thought I would ever hear or see what I have just heard and seen, especially in here. He says, I forgive you, but these thousands, they are all ready. It's too late, he said. They are crying to Allah for revenge. Now he says, please, 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 go out before they get up from their prayers or they will kill you. You're a good man. I don't want your blood spilled here in Istanbul, please. I said, all right, I will go. And I turned, and he walked out to the door with me, and I put on my shoes. He said to me still with tears running down his face, if this could have only been done centuries ago, Islam would not be in the place that they're in with the bloodshed that they're in now. But it's too late. Please hurry away. They're going to be coming out now any second, and they will kill you. I remitted the sins of the innocent blood there in that blue mosque, just like I remitted the sins of the innocent blood 
back in 2009 in, in Beijing, in the capital of China, as I went in and out of all of the offices of the leaders of China with a badge on that said I was the ambassador of the United States of America to China. How do you do this? I didn't ask for it. I was set up. God sets me up all the time. I just walk with Him. When you walk with Jesus, you wind up before kings. I've dined in the house of lords with the lords. How did I do that? I met a man on the streets, and the Lord said, tell him about me, and I began to tell him about the Lord. <laughs> and that man was the number one security agent for Charles and Diana. <laughs> and he said to me, have you seen, were you going to see the prince today? And I said, I didn't even know he was coming to this town. He said, oh, yes. If you'd like, I can put you within arm's length of him. I said, my wife, she's at the hotel. Her too? He says, absolutely. I've got pictures standing right with Charles and Diana accepting the Lord Mayor S's granddaughter's bouquets of flowers right in front of me. I had to put the camera back like this, taking pictures so there's a little bit of hair showing. It's mine. And I'm moving it around in the security people. Security people, when I moved the camera back, I could have hit Charles in the head with it. The security people step forward, and the head of security says, it's all right. Stand back. <laughs> so I got choice pictures. Pictures of the Lord Mayor S as her granddaughters are presenting the flowers to Diana. I had made enlargements, had them lovely framed and presented them to her. She cried. She cried and said, you captured the moment of my life. What can I do for you? I said, you can let me pray for you. Oh, I would love that. I said, do you know Jesus? She said, I'm an Anglican, of course. I said, but have you asked Jesus into your heart? No, I haven't. Must I do this? I said, absolutely. Then help me. <laughs> you see, God opens doors that no man can open. It's his word. And he shuts doors that no man can shut. We just have to walk with him. We sing it. If we walk with the Lord in the light of His love, what glory He sheds on our way. If we'll do His good will, He abides with us still, for we've only to trust and obey. That's all I've done. That's a story of 48, 51 now, 51 years. 51 years walking countries and praying them, raising 13 children, yeah, all kinds of injuries. We have a little plaque. Every time we move, it goes above our closet, closet door in our master bedroom. The greatest aid to adult education are children. <laughs> They've taught us tremendous faith. They've tested our faith so many times. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for testing my faith. Thank you for shaking me up. Thank you for letting me hear doctors say, we've got to amputate those fingers. Thank you for letting the, the doctors hear them, hear me say, how much time have I got before you have to amputate my little three-year-old's four fingers? The doctor looks at me and says, you don't understand. That was a storm grate of a sewer drain along the street that crushed those fingers and destroyed the bone and makes those fingers hang by little pieces of flesh. I could cut them off with scissors. There's no bone to cut. What do you mean, how much time have I got? I said, sir, we believe in prayer. Would you please just wrap up that hand and let us take him, take him home and pray I'll give you 24 hours. If you're not back here in 24 hours, the family services will come and they'll take that son and they'll take the rest of your children. Do you understand? Yes, sir, I do. Thank you. We cried out to God in that 24 hours. 
I'll never forget taking that, that soccer ball of gauze wrapped around that little hand. He had to hold that soccer ball of gauze soaked with his blood. Back into that room and ask the nurse, could we come in with you? Of course. I'd like you to be there. Here's our sweet little boy, the one that was born dead. You see how the devil hated him, yeah. wanted to destroy him? was out to destroy him in every way he could because he knew the day would come when he'd be in Mozambique asking the chiefs, Muslim chiefs and militant leaders, do you have anybody here blind? Anyone deaf? Yes. Bring them to us. We'll pray and God will heal them. That's their introduction to the leaders of villages. <laughs> he told me there in December, he said, we were walking out of a village when the chief said, no, we're Muslim. You go or we kill you. He says, we're walking out of the village. And here comes a lady pulling a lady who's blind. And she grabs my hand and puts it on the blind lady's head. He said, I look at the blind lady. Her eyes are as white as my shirt. There's no pupil, no iris in either eye. And all of a sudden, the blind lady throws her hands up, dancing all over. She's got perfect eyeballs. The chief comes running, looks into her face. He knows her. She's got perfect vision. You come to my village. You come back. You tell about your God. He's greater than Allah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes, that's my God. <laughs> well, Tonight we'll tell a little more, the Lord willing. That's just a little piece of it. The fingers. The fingers. Yeah, we'll finish that. I'll, you, you don't want to come back tonight and find the rest of the story? <laughs> we took him back in 23 hours. Early in case if there was a traffic jam or something, we didn't want to go over 24 hours, you know. That's the law, right? He was on the record. We take him back. They bring him right in. We go in with him. The nurse is unraveling all the gauze. She gets down to the point where the dried blood is, and every so often she's jerking it because it isn't soaked in the saline well enough yet. And she's looking at my son, Peter, and she's saying, I'm sorry, did that hurt? And he's just looking and smiling and saying, no, no. And she's getting this strange look on her face as it's getting down to where the gauze is wrapped around individually, this finger here and around this finger to hold these fingers together and around the thumb to hold the fingers together. And it's all soaked with blood, of course. And she's pulling it out of the saline solution and she's loosening it from his thumb and again she break jerks and I'm so sorry, didn't I? No. She goes over to what the little finger that had been severed right here and She's trying to get the gauze off. She's going ever so carefully, and all of a sudden, she kind of jerks it, and the finger doesn't come off. And she grabs the finger, and she's going like this down in the saline solution, and she starts feeling. She starts feeling these fingers, and she runs out screaming, Doctor! Doctor! Come quick! Doctor! Come quick! <laughs> the doctor comes running in there. They're not as gentle as nurses are. I don't know if you've noticed that. He starts pulling this gauze off. He's just pulling it off. And he's washing his little hand with that saline solution. He puts it over by the sink and he's washing it off. He's, he looks at us and he says, because he knew we had twin daughters. He says, do you have twin sons? You haven't switched sons on us, have you? I says, no, doctor. There's only one Peter James in my family. And you're looking at him. He goes out of, the, out of the room, comes back with an x-ray. Took an x-ray. You know, they make money. You don't need x-rays when the fingers are all, the bones are crushed, and you can cut them with, with, with scissors. But I guess you need them to know how far deep to do or whatever. I don't know. But to me, foolish. He slaps it up on the display thing. He says, look at this. There are no bones on those four fingers. Do you see that? I said, yes, sir, I do. He says, what is your explanation? I said, Jesus. <laughs> he said, do you know that's a miracle? I said, yeah. 
He's a miracle worker. Scratches his head. How am I going to write this in my report? I said, just put one name there, Jesus. <laughs> he says, the hospital administrator won't understand that. I says, I think he will. When you show him the two x-rays, you want to take another x-ray? <laughs> it changed that man's life. You see, God said in his word, you and I are created. You were created. You're created for signs, wonders, and miracles. You were created to believe God and perform them. This word says you got them. Jesus said it's finished. It was a done deal. Yes. That cancer, I told that doctor across that table at me, from me, that doctor said, do you know how sick of a man you are? She said, I can tell just looking into your eyes, your electrolytes are all gone. There is death in your eyes. I just signed over before I came here to this morning, signed over three people in critical care to hospice. They're going to die. They're way into fifth stage cancer. Do you realize you are beyond fifth stage cancer. What are you doing here? You should be back in Iowa giving your family your last hours. I said, Doctor, I am not sick. She said, are you in denial? I said, yes. <laughs> I'm denying that I'm going to die of cancer. She said, but you're already almost dead. I said, I know. I fight battles sometimes in the night. My spirit starts leaving my body, and I command it back in the name of Jesus. And I take dominion over my human spirit and say, you will not, you will not go from my body for cancer. Get back here in the name of Jesus. Now, that's a battle with life and death. Do you know that? Now, I know what death is. I died in 84 in an automobile accident, was dead for a half an hour. So I know how you die. I know what happens when you die. And I knew I was dying in the night when I would have blood pour out of me, flush the toilet, flush it, flush it all night long, dark red with blood. I knew you, you've only got so much blood to give, like about eight pints, and you're done. Every night, Jesus gave me a blood transfusion. So I have got to have the blood of Jesus in me. <laughs> it's got to be there because it isn't mine. Mine's all down the toilet. <laughs> David said in Psalms, I prevented the dawning. You ever studied that word, prevented the dawning? It means, it's another word saying, I longed for the daylight. I had enough of this darkness of the night. I long for the day. He was a warrior. He'd, warriors don't fight at night, do they? But they know the first dawn they're ready to go because the enemy's coming. You've got to be ready. I long for the dawning. I prevented the dawning. He had to have gone through some horrible trials to write Psalms 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I've been through it. I didn't come back through it, though. Isn't that wonderful? I went through it one way. I say I backslid through heaven. I was sitting back, sitting and going backwards through the valley of the shadow of death. I was in a sitting position. I died in a sitting position. The rough roof come down, the corner bar of the car top carrier with 10 people's luggage. That bar came through the roof right into my head. I didn't last very long at that point. It hurt. Yes, it hurt. It hurt all the way to my toes. And then it didn't hurt anymore. I was gone. I left that van. It was still tumbling, tossing with my wife and eight children in it. <laughs> when I went into the valley of the shadow, I heard the sweetest voice. I thought it was Jesus. You know what it said? Turn around. The light is here. And I went, no! I want to go back. My family's hurt. They need me. 
And silence again in that darkness, like liquid darkness. It's not just a shadow. It's like liquid darkness. But I feared no evil. I was sitting. I had my hands cupped to my ears in the valley of the shadow, trying to listen to the something else, sign of life of my family. I couldn't hear a thing except the sensation I was in a tunnel. Because when you're in a tunnel, the sound of your being comes into your ears a whole different way, doesn't it? Drive into a tunnel with your car, roll your windows down, blindfold you, and you can tell immediately when you hit the tunnel, can't you? That's exactly why I call it a tunnel. Again, the light, the, the word spoke to me, turn around this time with a greater agent, uh, urgency. Turn around, the light is here. And I said, no, I want to go back. My family's hurt, they need, need me. You see, two times I refused that light. Then I shot out of that tunnel going through the heavens. And I could talk for two hours on that one, all the way to the Milky Way and back. I described the heavens. I described Saturn. I described the, the two rings around Saturn that they've always called them gas rings. No, they're glacial ice rings. I said that. And the number one astrophysicist of NASA said, no, they're gas rings. Why do you call them ice rings? I said, because they're like glacial ice. I've been in the, in the Arctic. I know what glacial ice sparkles like. It, the reason you think they're gases is because these glacial ice rings, he says, do you realize what you're saying? That means there's oxygen on the moon, uh, on Saturn. I says, well, there's oxygen on the earth. If God wants there to be oxygen on Saturn, can't there be oxygen on Saturn? Oh, he says, tell me more. Up to the day that dear man died, Dr. Bronik Romanowski, the number one astrophysicist of NASA. I was in contact with him for years. He'd call me, say, we got a problem. Pray, will God tell you something? And they'd tell me the problem. I'd say, well, that's simple. I experienced that at this point. Tell him to do this. And it was the answer. God would just give me wisdom from what I experienced. <laughs> that's my God, people. Hallelujah. That was a wonderful death experience. It hurt to get my head crushed. <laughs> but the Lord brought me back. He brought me back. Our 15-year-old daughter stood over me. They tried to do CPR, and when they blew in my mouth, the blood shot out of the hole in my head, in their face. How long would you do CPR if blood shoots out of somebody's head into your face? I wouldn't. They plugged my nose. The blood shot out. They plugged the hole in my head, blew in my mouth, blood shot out of my nose. They gave up. They figured they tried to do CPR about three minutes and said, I'm not going at it again. One was a forest ranger. They know how to do CPR. And two were people that had been a, done a tow truck company for years, and they were very well versed on CPR. All three of them gave up, but Jesus didn't. Hallelujah. But he was giving me a wonderful experience all the way to the Milky Way and back. My trip ended with our 15-year-old daughter who had run around to my wife who had taken the four little ones out of the back of the van was praying for them on the other side. She'd seen me get out of the van. I don't remember that. I forced the sliding door open and got out and fell down. United States Air Force number one specialist in spinal injuries and crash victims said, I fully understand that. I believe you did that. I said, good, nobody else does. Why do you believe it? Well, he says, I attended a crash site one time where a fighter plane doing a missile dive went to dive under, but he didn't dive under in time. He hit the ground too soon, and his plane went into the ground. He crawled out of the wreckage, out of the ground, ran 100 yards, losing his shoes on the way, and the media said he dropped dead 100 yards from the wreckage. He said, Henry... He was dead on impact. He said, the man's body, I saw the body, I, I looked it over. Every bone in his body was shattered like glass. The adrenaline was in his muscles to get out of that plane, and his muscles were supercharged to get out of wreckage that was impossible to get out of and to run, and his shoes fell off because all he had left was no bone structure to hold his shoes on. And he dropped dead, they said, but he was dead already. It was the adrenaline thing of what we call running around like a chicken with his head cut off. 
What makes a chicken run around after you cut his head off? He can't think about what he's doing. It's the adrenaline <laughs> in his muscles. <laughs> so he said, I believe your testimony, Henry. I said, thank you, brother. I appreciate that. It's nice to get verification from somebody once in a while like that, see? So I came back into my body. Hallelujah. Now, obviously, I'm here. Within six days, the hole in my head that I stuck my thumb in and realized, whoops, put the, put the towel with the ice cubes back on, walking around. I thought, if they see that, they won't take no for the hospital. I'm going to my daughter's wedding. <laughs> I didn't know the blood had shot out of the hole in their faces. <laughs> you see, I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> but God, God did it. He blessed us. He kept me alive. My work wasn't finished yet. And that's what it's all about. God bless you. I don't know if it's helped you and challenged your faith a little bit or made you feel like you don't even know the Lord. Sometimes people say, man, you talk about stuff like this, and I don't know if I even know the Lord. I say, well, it's time to get to know him then, isn't it? <laughs> There's no condemnation. I'm just here to challenge you. I'm here to say, come on. This book is filled with what? 33,000 promises? Is that what they say? 33,000. And you've sang it. Don't lie to the Lord. Every promise in the book is mine. And you don't even claim the first one. Every chapter, every verse, every line. <laughs> don't sing it if you don't mean it. According to his word divine, every promise in the book is mine. Claim it. It's yours. Mine, mine, mine. Jesus is mine. Well, he's the author of this book. He's the living word of God, isn't he? So if you walk with Jesus, that was what the title was supposed to be, that he asked for the title this morning, walking with Jesus. I think we stayed in context, didn't we? If you walk with Jesus and trust and obey, then you get the axe. Hallelujah. You get the power to be a witness. Don't you want to get the axe? I don't mean get fired from your job. I mean you get a new job. You get to see what the Lord has done. And when they sing the song, look what the Lord has done, you can sing it and say, yeah, woo -hoo! and you start thinking about what he's done, and you get happy, and you have a hard time standing still.